To believe in ourselves, sometimes we need just someone else to believe in us first. This is a quote that I thought a lot about when I was talking to Principal L and his amazing journey as an administrator, as an educator, to really actually continuously focus on doing what's best for kids. And his stories of advocating and sticking up for his staff, the amazing stories of him connecting with incredible people have really inspired me. And after this, I felt like I got like a mini keynote uh, for the last 40 minutes. It was an incredible conversation. And it just really reminded me how important our kids know that we elevate them, that we lift them to do things that they actually think don't believe they could do themselves. And that belief that we have in them inspires them to have a belief in the work that they can do, the impact they can have on their lives and the lives of others. And Principal L is the embodiment of this. This is an absolutely wonderful conversation. You are going to walk away leaving so excited to having uh, had this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. I, I love doing this podcast so much and I'm so glad you could be here today because I reach out to people, you know, in hopes that they'll say yes to joining me on the podcast. And I just sat down with Principal L. We're about to have a conversation and just he has amazing stories. He's an amazing person. I'm like jacked. I don't even know if I could sit down. I might have to do the podcast standing up after talking to him for the last little while. But Principal L is uh, someone, an administrator, an educator that so many people look up to. I've followed his work for years and even just kind of listening to him and just having conversations with him before we started recording this. He has so many amazing stories, so many amazing experiences, and it's a credit to the work that he does to empower people because I know he will not take credit for the stuff that he does. So I'm going to give it to him before because he's such a big believer in the people that he serves and does everything for them. And he has a lot of great stories on that. So principal L thanks so much for taking the time today. I know there's a million things you could be doing, uh, probably with all of the TV shows that you've been on. This is kind of like a huge downgrade that some guy from Canada with a mic, but here we are. So Principal L, thanks for being on. Can you just tell with people? With the Toronto Raptors shirt on. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, had, I had to do it. I had to do it. They this, beat my sixes, man. I know. I, I know. Just... I had to do it. I know you love basketball and that, you know, we just, we just beat you, but Hey, principal, can you just tell a little bit about your career and kind of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I, um, I, I grew up in, you know, in the city of Philadelphia, you know, in, in the housing projects, great community, uh, raised by a single mom, um, supported by my teachers. Um, um, I, uh, started in the you know, inner city elementary school, my mother walked into my, my third grade classroom. I was next to the youngest. My mother raised six boys as a single mom. And um, uh, I was next to the youngest. And my mom said to my, my teacher, young white female, not from my community, but they're saving Private Ryan every day, George. And mm. uh, she said, please, I need your support. I need your help. One of my children must graduate from college. And my teacher had every reason to say, I can't focus on your son. I've got 20, 25 other students to help, but that's not what good teachers do. Excellent teachers move ordinary children to do extraordinary things. Mm. Work with my fourth grade teacher was an older African-American female, been in our school about 30, 40 years. We thought she came with the building. So um, had about 10 after school programs, not one had a title. They were all called get in here. And we got in, we all had that adult <laughs> who, you know, who supported us. And, and uh, those two ladies helped me get into a middle magnet school for gifted kids, went on to high school, met some fabulous teachers and administrators, started playing ball, thought I could skip college and go to the NBA. They said, no, son, you can't jump over credit cards. So you're not going to the NBA, but you can get an MBA. So that's what good teachers do. They're honest with you, right? They have that relationship is authentic and they can tell you the truth. Went away to college, came home, started working in television, went into a high school, George, one day to talk to some, my teacher said, come speak to some kids on career day about your, your yeah. job in TV. I'm working in, you know, uh, uh, hoping to develop a career as a sports announcer. I was a production assistant. And the kids, you know, and I'm bragging about how these teachers were such a different in my life. And the kids said, if you can come in and motivate us and you love these teachers so much, how come you aren't a teacher? And I'd never thought about that. Oh. Like, why wasn't I a teacher, right? And so uh, I quit my TV job, got a master's degree, 
certificate to teach, went right back to the same high school. Two years later, started teaching. And the, I thought the kids would thank me for, you know, coming back to work. They said, no, nah, you were a fool to leave that TV job. We were hoping you would help us do the job when you graduated. <laughs> But, you know, these kids can be so concrete, man. And that's how yeah. my career started. And I started working in high school, but realized that high school reform does not begin in high school. 50% of the kids in the urban school districts drop out in the ninth grade or before. So I dedicated 10 years of my life in our feeder middle school. And in 10 years, we lost almost 20 kids to murder in our community. And I knew wow. I, had to, I had to have an impact in the community. And that's when I started teaching kids to play chess, George. Yeah, and you actually you were just you were just saying about that you were on Good Morning, and I was like saying you're like on Good Morning America, and then the George Carlos podcast. <laughs> so sorry, man. That's okay. That's, Listen, the, I know. gotta I gotta see I gotta stay in the trenches. See, you're making it happen. See, you you and I can relate. So um, uh, we're in the same foxhole. So this is an honor. Thanks, this man. is an honor for me. I just need you to wear a Sixers shirt. Today. <laughs> I will. Okay, I will. I will. Hey, so you were actually, you were just talking about this and like, I, I'm going to get to the chess thing in a second, but there's something I want to ask you about because I, when I feel, when I talk to you, when I read your stuff, when I see your posts on social media, one thing that, you know, and like this is like, I, no, no matter what the pedagogy, your leadership style, any of this stuff, like I'm sure people have criticized you for elements in your lifetime, right? I don't think anyone could ever criticize you that you don't believe in kids and believe in their abilities or believe in their abilities to flourish. Do you think that matters? Like, you know, like how much does, well, I know you know it matters. How much does that actually matter in the development of a kid? Just that belief that you have in them. It's, it's a game changer. It is the great equalizer. When people talk about equity today, mm -hmm. I think the idea is that every child, you know, my, my motto is every child deserves at least one person to be crazy about them. Yep. Um, but I also believe that, that the children must know that we have, when we, when they know that we have the belief that they're intelligent, that they can be successful, that they're capable, it, it, it gives them this feeling that they're able, that, they, that, they, that, that, that uh, intelligence crosses all racial lines, mm -hmm. all religious lines, all, all, all social lines, economic lines, that it, even, even if that child has had some adult in the past who doubted them every day, whether because of implicit or explicit bias, mm -hmm. the fact that an adult believes in them gives them the power. They, and I hear people, when you hear people talk about these stories all the time, how they had this one person who believed right. in them so much that they started believing that they could do it. Like they started believing, yeah, I, I, I can go to school. I can be successful. Yep. I, 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 I can get a job. I, I, I can start my own company. Um, so I, I believe that the most important thing that we can do for kids is let kids know that we loved you before we ever met you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you do or say, it's not going to change the way I feel about you. And for some children, they don't hear that often, that people love and care about them. And oftentimes when they hear it, it'll be from some adult in some schoolhouse, you know, somewhere. So. It's um. I'll never get accused of that. I might get accused of loving them too much. My teacher yep. say, "Principal, oh, you always want to give them everything, that, <laughs> you know." And they know I, I just, I just, and they know I, I, I love them. And I'm just so thankful for the teachers I work with who support me. All the Saturday schools and the summers and all the things that we do. And I take care of my teachers too because I know they give so much of themselves. So we must take care of teachers. But my first book was I choose to stay. Mm -hmm. And that's a choice I made. And the kids actually came up with that with that title because um, I turned down a big raise, you know, uh, when I was offered to leave the school. And they told me, thanks for choosing to stay. But you know what they also said to me, though, George, that I, don't, I didn't mm -hmm. think about that we choose to be here as well. Yeah. That, we, that, that we have children, their families, they can be anywhere, but they choose to be in our presence. I posted on Twitter the other day a poem often about, you know, I ain't got a pencil. All the things, you know, this kid is talking about, you know, getting his sister right. dressed for school, no heat, no parent, and, 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 and gets to school, gets him a warm breakfast, and gets to class, and then the teacher fusses with him because he ain't got a pencil. Right. Right? And I, I was that teacher at one time. You know, if you don't, yep. you're not ready for life, you're not ready for school, but I needed to understand that these children go through so much just to be in our presence. And this pandemic has uncovered a lot of that for folks mm -hmm. who were in denial. That yes, these children struggle often 
and when they get to, but they they want to be with us. So yeah, that that's a five minute response to a five second question. Hey. But that that belief that that belief is so important for their resilience, their self efficacy, their self esteem, their self confidence. When we improve all of those constructs for children, then we're building them to, to deal with any failure, any struggle in life. Because we can't change, we can't alter that. They will struggle. They they will have to overcome obstacles and barriers. But when but when 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 failure is normative, resilience becomes second nature, and that's what believing in kids does. You know, I'm li- so I'm listening to you, and I like I. I... Uh, like my my own children are you know one's about to enter school she's four and a half years old and we have a seven jeez oh, I should know this eight eight or nine months something so she's a baby still oh you got a new baby yeah Ooh. yeah 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 and and like when this is something that's really important to me and I like you just brought it home is that when we talk about equity it's it's about raising everyone up to their highest levels and I think that to me is what is really powerful in what you're saying is seeing that kids can achieve more that they have they are like you know there is a belief and like when we talked earlier today i think a lot of people believed in you but you also had to raise yourself up too and that's what they believed you could do and put that you know like i've always said that sometimes that what we need and i think this is really crucial for teachers is that for us to believe in ourselves somebody has to believe in us first and you've shown that, and it's like, that's what raises people up. And so I really appreciate your focus on, you know, raising everybody up. And I think that to me is, is crucial because you can sometimes see like, Hey, let's like knock some people down, you know, so that we can attain their levels. Like, no, you got, everybody's got to be raised up. And like, when you talk about, um, we, you'd mentioned, you know, being on good morning America, like, you know, maybe, maybe you got to hook up for me at some point when I can cross the border and go on. But you talked about your chess team, right? And I love this. And you're like, it, just your excitement about it. So tell us a little bit about the chess team and, you know, not only about the process, but what does it lift kids up to do? I love it. So I, when, when I first started working in this middle school, um, you know, I found out that they had a story chess program years prior to my mm-hmm. arrival, but the coach had left the program died. And I, and I just, my, my brother taught me to play chess when I was young. I, I have, you know, older brothers, of course as I mentioned, and but he only taught me enough moves so he could continue to beat me. So I really <laughs> didn't learn about the power of chess until I was in college and I started teaching about, and I started learning about how mathematical chess is. So I started teaching special education students, mathematics on the chess board, mm-hmm. right? Knights move on right angles, bishops move on diagonals. The chess board is a large square that contains 64 smaller squares. What I thought I was giving these students was mathematics, but what I was really giving them was intellectual capital. Mm-hmm. They were now walking around a school carrying chess boards. And if you don't assume anything else, George, about a kid who's carrying a chess board, you assume that they are intelligent. You, you believe that they're smart. So I learned early in my career as a teacher that smart is not something you are. It is something that you can become. Mm-hmm. These kids are walking around carrying chess boards and other kids, are, you play chess? Aren't you in a learning disabled program? They say, yeah, let's play a match and see if you should be my roommate, right? It, it, it wow. humbles you. Yeah. But, you know, but also the confidence and then the girls started playing because, you know, chess is a sport that's dominated by men. But as you witness in the, the uh, uh, Netflix hit, Queen, yeah. The Queen's Gambit, yeah. um, th- now that's a fictional story, but it just shows you, but it's a story about a woman who, who becomes a, a, a very, very good in a game dominated by men. Mm-hmm. But, story that, that good morning america covered for me was about my girls team who are that's the queen's gambit personified yeah i mean these are kids these are girls who come from struggling communities struggling homes uh, many of them single parents but these kids are playing chess and 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 and, and recording their moves in algebraic notation so in kindergarten first second third grade they're writing algebra problem solving critical thinking uh, learning, not not just seeing the turn, but seeing around the turn. Some of these girls, they're, they're going away to college on full scholarships. They don't need any man. They don't need any guy to make their life complete. I tell these girls, listen, when a guy comes to you and offers you his phone number, you tell him first he needs to solve a quadratic equation and factor <laughs> a polynomial. Then call me when you graduate from school because if he's not on his way, he will be in your way. I have two daughters now. My daughters are teenagers and one's in college. 
But I tell them all the time that you have to make, you have to be strong. We have to build, like you said, build them up mm -hmm. right there. And, and, and Georgia it's, it's crazy, but there are people who believe the only way for them to get ahead is they got to tear other people down. You see it on social media. Mm -hmm. Like they have to build, they have to totally change whatever you wrote just to make themselves look good. We don't have to do that. Nope. We can build each, we can build each other up. Iron sharpens iron. But this chess program for me was a way for me to sit at a table with a kid, learn about them. We, we play chess for hours and just talk. Some of them never had that kind of interaction. And I, I of course, I was just teaching mathematics, but these kids went on to become national champions. Arnold Schwarzenegger came to visit our school when wow. he was running for president. Then challenged one of my girls to a chess match. I said, Arnold, you don't want to play these girls. <laughs> they wanted the guys. These girls treat the chess pieces like offspring. They play hours and never trade a piece. He said, no, I want to play her, right? We'll play little Denise Picker. Pink glasses, honor roll student. She said, I, I'm, I was nervous, Mr. L. He's rich. He's famous and he's married to a woman who has more money than he does. So I know he's upset. I said, how do you know about that? She said, but I just treat him like he was another guy and I checkmate him. Arnold said, you terminated the Terminator. Then agreed to write the forward in my book. So my first book, Arnold wrote the forward and talked about Denise in the forward. He remembered that butt kicking that he received from Denise. But, um, but talked about how using chess as a weapon against so many of the, of the ills of the community and um and this it just became so popular and still and that uh, 1997 was the first time my students went on to win in the nationals and that was in philly i'm in delaware now my students are two-time national champions wow. um to 2014 2016 the only school in delaware that ever win a national chess title did it twice in uh in in, in two years and 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 with so many girls at the front you know we, we live in this era of Kamala Harris, first female vice president, first African American, first you know Asian with Jamaican roots, uh, uh, just just so many firsts for women. Um, but to think that that begins somewhere with some little girl, that someone said to them, "You can do it. You can be whoever you you know. You can do whatever you want to do. But there will be struggle, but you you can overcome it." So I'm so proud of these girls for doing a great thing. All the girls and the guys just the tremendous effort they're making and um, and all of the attention that they get, which inspires people to understand that children have to be challenged to use, to use their minds. And that, so if anyone ever says you can't get excited over chess, <laughs> just so you know, just watch, just watch the last couple of minutes. If you can't get excited over chess, that's amazing. And I, I think that, that, like, you know, going back to that notion of belief, I actually just started my uh, podcast bucket list. And uh, I actually just put one item on there that I, I have said that is now on my bucket list, but it's already crossed off. Get Principal L to do an Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> impression. It's checked <laughs> off. I want to play her. <laughs> that was <laughs> Michael Jordan played. Will, Will Smith played. Will Smith wrote the forward in my, my Immortality Infinite book. What Will, is going on here? Listen, I was at Will's house in California trying to get this man to understand how now will's a chess player but but it's so many people out in this world who play who play chess lebron james plays chess that's incredible there's so many people because they it teach it, it yeah. forces them to think when they're on the court football players curtis martin talked about how he would go sit and play chess with jim brown and just for hours just play chess talk football talk strategy it, it is such an amazing incredible. game and it's intergenerational that's what makes it powerful. You know what I love about this is that your excitement for what you're sharing right now is guaranteed going to get someone to start their own program. And that's... I'm, I'll bring it down. I'll bring it. I, I, some of my, my, my kids in school say, they say, Principal, you gotta, you're doing too much, Principal. Calm. calm you're, you're too hot. <laughs> no, that's good. I love it. I love it. What is it? Uh, the Ralph Waldo ever said, nothing great has ever been achieved without enthusiasm, right? I love it. Exactly. So... We need... And we need, they need to start those chess yeah. programs. And they can reach out to me as well if they need support. I offer support, no cost at all. I can give them resources, books, materials. Chess boards are hard to get because of the Queen's Gambit notoriety. But any wow. anybody who follows your podcast yeah. who needs support, if they mention your name okay. and not mention the Raptors, I will help. <laughs> <It's the> two, <laughs> two parts there. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Hey, 
you know, you said something that, um, you know, I think will resonate with a lot of people is that, you know, you often see people tearing people down to, and, and like my focus, your focus has been like lift people up. Right. And I think part of it is that in education, there's, there is obstacles that we have to deal with as a profession and there's struggles that we have as a profession. And you reminded me, we talked earlier and I was hoping you might kind of want to discuss it and talk about this. Oh, for our kids to be successful. And I, you know, I, I, I've grown in my career, you know, saying like, it's always, we always go do what's best for kids. And sometimes felt like I actually put the interests of kids and, and pushed aside adults. And I think that I became better at that saying, like, if you serve the adults, then the kids will be taken care of. That is what's best for kids. And you talked about this and you briefly mentioned it, but I wonder if you could kind of expand it more. You actually, you, you, the current job that you have, is this okay to talk about? You know, yeah, bring it up. Yeah. 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 And you, you, My you, you mentioned is- it and it's your current job that you had, you almost lost because you were advocating for your teachers. So can you talk about that experience and, and what happened? Yeah, I, um, for, uh, I, I work in a, in a very high needs community. Um, and I work in a, a charter school, which is authorized by the state. So we're mm-hmm. a public school, 90 plus percent high poverty. It's a struggling community, but those teachers have been there for years and they're underpaid. I mean, as all teachers are underpaid. So I felt that as the principal, it was my job to sort of campaign and advocate for them with the board that we've got to find a way to uh, pay our teachers more. And um, there was this, uh, there was a faction of the board, not the entire board, but mm-hmm. a faction of the board just felt that that's not your job. As a, as a principal, you serve the board. Right. My belief, as you said, was if I want to help these kids, I got to serve Help these the teachers. teachers. Yep. And it's not. And, and here's the thing. The, any raise you get teachers, it's not going to change their life. But the idea is it just shows them that we value you. And 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 I, I just needed to I needed to find a way when you you know, when it's it's a noble job to say you're a teacher. But when you go to the supermarket to pay for your groceries, they want to hear that you're a teacher. They need you to pay that bill. Yeah. So um, so I just I campaign and I campaign and to the point where um board just came in one day with the police and said, listen, you can't come back into the school that we believe that, you know, luckily I was, I didn't I know was, that part. Yeah, they came back now. So I wasn't, I was actually with, with, uh, Jimmy, Todd, Jeff, yeah. we were doing this, uh, 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 what, what, what great teachers do. Yep. Um, uh, professional development. And my AP called me and said, listen, the board is, they're, they're here with the police. Jeez. And they, they emailed me, called me and said, don't come back to the school, turn in your keys, turn in your computer. And I'm like, what is the problem? You're under investigation. What did I do? So then um, they changed the locks on 18 doors. This was like lean on me, like 2017. It's like <laughs> I so remember my, that movie. So my Yeah. So my teachers are like, what's going on? You got the police in there and, you know, um, and so they, they asked for a meeting with the board and they said, what are you investigating? He said, we don't know what we're investigating, but when we do, we'll let you know. And the teacher <laughs> said, no, that, that doesn't work for us. That's that, you know, that man fights for us. They knew what it was about. Right. And, 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 um, and, and several teachers said that the board, some board members said to them, what is it about this man that you follow him like this? Like they struggled with the fact that these teachers were following my leadership. So they tried to win the people, but they underestimated the people. They underestimated mm-hmm. teachers. They tried to make me look like a criminal. Um, and so the next day, the teachers walked out. They, and I had never shared with the community yeah. or parents that I was struggling with the board to try to get better pay and working conditions for these teachers. I never shared it because I didn't want to embarrass the right. school because if I embarrass the school, it impacts the kids. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I want the kids to flourish. But once the teachers decided, and so half the staff came to work anyway because they said, this is how teachers think. Somebody has to be here to tell the right. kids what's going on. So we all can't stay out. But they told the board, until that man's back, we, we, there, there'll be no school. When the parents found out, they said, what are they doing? What's going on? So the parents wow. organized this huge march. Fox News goes live from the front of the school. Then. And um, so in two days, Five board members resigned, and um, we got a new board. I got my job back. Teachers got their raise. Administrators got raises. 
um, and um, we're in a, such a better place. But I said to myself, wow, these people put there, because they were told by the board, if you don't come to work tomorrow, you will be fired. 30 people did not show up to work, George, to That's send incredible. a message. Um, and, and, and I'm telling you, if they hadn't walked out, I'd be here right now with you, uh, <laughs> you walking like, around, non-void, looking like yeah. pretty boy Floyd and unemployed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they, you know, it was, it was, they, they fought, they knew I was fighting for them and they, um, and they fought for me. And we had some board members who did not get involved with that, who opposed that. And they helped to develop a strong board right now. We have a great board. And, uh, but it just, it shows you what happens when teachers stand up, you know, especially at this time when, when you, you got all this, all this talk around, you know, forcing teachers to go back in buildings mm -hmm. that may not be ready for them to go back in a COVID environment. And there are some schools that I'm sure should be open, are ready to open, but there are some that don't have the proper ventilation, don't have the yeah. proper PPE, proper spacing. Um, so we have to value our teachers. And this was one where, they stood up for me. And that's why choosing to stay means so much to me. That's why I had those shirts printed. And so many people have supported the movement because it's a powerful statement that we, when, when we choose to stay for one another, we choose mm -hmm. to stay for the kids. And that could be in any role you're in. doesn't matter who you are. You could be in the cafeteria making pancakes. But when you make that choice, it sends a message to the world that that we're, we're we're choosing our children we're choosing to work and support one another this is this is incredible so this is like you obviously have the connection so there's gonna be a movie so i'm just gonna ask i'm just gonna ask this right now if it could be set in the 70s i know a guy who looks like one of the bgs who'd be a great character that would be you. right You'd be <laughs> That's actually how the podcast. That's actually how the podcast started. It was that you commented that I look like one of the Bee Gees, which is the, the after you lost the weight. When I saw your picture on Facebook, I'm just saying like, that's one of the Bee Gees. I said, "No, it's George. Look uh, at him." Uh, like, only like there's like two people that would get that, and I think it's you and me. <laughs> so, so just saying, if you could set that in the '70s, I got a guy who looks like one of the Bee Gees would fit right into the cast. So oh my God, you are, you're, you are in no, no audition needed. <laughs> well, Hey, this is actually, this is perfect segue because obviously that community, uh, not, and I'm not just talking, you know, like I'm not just talking staff, I'm talking parents, kids, amazing how they came to, to, together for you. And you actually wrote a book, which like obviously is the, is the most like makes sense title is building a winning culture. And so talk about that book. You know, I, I, like it's amazing because obviously you've everything that you've been talking about in this podcast lends into that notion of building a winning culture. But I know there's a lot building, more that you share. Building a, building a winning team. Sorry, building a winning about, team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but about building a strong culture. Yeah, yeah. So it, I mean, they go because you can't have a winning team without a strong culture, and when you build a strong culture, you'll have a strong positive team. So they go. They go hand in hand. And now I'm, you know, I'm a co-author on it with two great guys, mm -hmm. um, two uh, district level administrators here in Delaware with me, um, Dr. Joseph Jones, who's a superintendent in our Voltec district, and Dr. T.J. Vari, who's assistant superintendent in Appaquinimic School District, the fastest growing school district you know, in Delaware. Um, and we've worked together for years. We actually wrote Passionate Leadership was our first book. Todd Whitaker wrote the forward, mm -hmm. you know, there. And Jimmy actually, Jimmy, yep. Jimmy Costas wrote the forward and building the winning team. Um, and and the, the power in it is that, you know, people often say teamwork makes the dream work, but there's so much work that goes into because when you're interviewing, when you're interviewing, when you're when you're recruiting people, you need to be thinking about them being a part of your team. And they all can't be the same. Everybody's got to bring something yep. different. Like I say, let's build each other up. Let's embrace our differences. Diversity is important. Diversity, ma diversity matters. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, bringing positive people onto your team will help you build a positive culture. And the principal is the prime facilitator of culture in the school. We, we make it. We make it or we break it. Now, teachers control that culture in the classroom. They help make up the greater culture in the school. But as the leader... You have to be visible. They can't only see you in the yearbook. They've got to see you. They've got to feel you. You've got to be a part of what's going on. 
and you got listen i i have teachers who have gone away i had a teacher who went to the middle east to see his kids every year for two weeks yeah. i taught his class the kids and then the kids they didn't like it they complained about it. they didn't want the principal teaching the class but every time they were going to get a sub they would ask me are you going to be the sub they don't want us to know it but they love having us there and and the teachers love knowing that we don't mind getting in the trenches you know with them that's how you build a, a strong culture the best form of recruitment is retention and the best form of retention is recruitment what's what i love and i know that you and i both have a love of basketball and when you talk about like diversity and having people bringing in different strengths but you also talk about the notion of positivity right uh, and like when I hired, I distinctly look for like, who, who's going to help move this vision forward, but also thinks different than I do. And, you know, it can actually connect with people that might not connect with me. I didn't need another George on my staff, right? Like I already got that. And the reason I bring up basketball is we've, we've both watched it long enough that there's sometimes these super teams that are built that don't ever actually pan out because they have too many people that are uh, really amazing at what they do, but they all kind of do the same thing. It's actually, you have to have people that do different things to actually, you know, to, to bring a team together. And it doesn't mean that they're not, um, cause I think sometimes when we think about that, there's sometimes where you have someone who has these positive ideas and then you have the negative person ripping them down so that you never move forward. And I don't think that's, what we're talking about it you can have different viewpoints but you still have that same focus that same big goal that you want to achieve together and we've seen that you know like there's teams that i could probably name that you could probably name that have that right it's, it's why the raptors won a couple of years ago and they beat philadelphia in that you know eastern conference semifinals because they actually had they had superstars but they had people that knew you know their roles and it's actually one of the reasons to be honest with you the sixers are doing really well is doc rivers is getting them to embrace their roles more. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to see that. And, and I, I love that because I know building winning team is something that you do. And it's something that connects with, you know, our, our love for basketball. And this actually is, be go ahead. Sorry. A Philly guy at the point guard. You got a Philly guy at the point guard there too. Kyle Lowry. Yes, sir. I love yes, him. Sir. You got some Philly influence in there. All right. And you know, what else was great about that team is you had guys who were hungry Yep. Who could have been superstars in other places, yep. who became stars, but it was the right place, right time, and that role was there to defer. You know, you have yep. to have, you know, I, I teach kids about chess. Every leader is not out front. Some people lead from the sidelines, some people lead from the rear, some on the flanks. They're chess pieces that attack on the flanks, but the idea just be someone who wants to make a difference, who wants to make choose impact over compliance. And that's the key. Get those people together. And, and they and they and they will rise but working together is the key okay so I gotta I gotta just say this about Kyle Lowry okay so I, I actually was there when they won the championship I was in uh at Golden State and I was high five I was sitting right behind Kyle Lowry's wife and his kids and I was high-fiving them while Kyle Lowry went off and I was just like it was amazing like it was pretty it was one of the coolest things ever because I saw this mom come in with her kids and they're all wearing Lowry jerseys and I'm like is that, that, and I'm, so I went to Google right away. I'm like, Kyle Lowry's wife. I'm like, oh, that's incredible, right? And they could win. And so I'm high fiving. It was one of the coolest experiences. So we love, yeah, we yeah. love Lowry in Canada, man. He's a great guy. His family, yeah. his mom. I mean, his whole that young man. What you see on the court is a manifestation of how he was raised. If you tell me, taught, if you how, tell me how, you know him, I'm shutting this podcast down because I can't handle this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I can't no, handle. I, no, Basically, everyone I've wanted to meet you've played chess with. Like, I, <laughs> no, I can't I, handle I this. <laughs> but he, but, but, but everybody in Philly knows his story oh, yeah. and his family. I yeah. have friends who know his family very well, and um, and 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 they they're amazing. So what you see mm -hmm. is is the result of years of hard work of pouring into that young man. He's very active in the community. Oh yeah, uh, very great personality, and um, he's a winner. You talk about building a winning is. team, you got to have a point guard. That's why I love Magic Johnson. Like he didn't Magic just, Johnson okay. wasn't the guy getting fifty points a game, nope. but Magic was about the assist. And as the principal, you have to you have to love assists more than you love points. You have to be more like Magic than you were so, Michael and Carmelo and these other guys. You got to set them up like a yep. Reese cup. 
so they don't look like a butternut. That's what you got to do. <laughs> hey, just one last thing on Lowry. Lowry. One thing I love about Lowry was he was not he was not a star. Like he worked his way up, and he didn't come into the NBA like. And he years and years he barely played. He came to Toronto, and talk about building winning team. They 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 brought him the 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 Messiah Jury talk like if you do you know who Messiah Jury is he's the GM he's the pre, he's either oh, the president right. or GM yeah, yeah. he's the one that had an issue at, at the, after the yep. game right uh, yeah. yeah he is I, I I know this is I don't I know this is an education podcast but I, I got to take this chance while we're here and the ladies always complain like why are they talk about sports Masa- in Mas- Messiah Jury so when they when the Raptors won they. It's it's actually it was kind of interesting when the Raptors won. There was like two rumors. One was Kawhi Leonard was going to go, and the other one was Masai Jury would leave. And I said, "Look, I can handle losing Kawhi. We cannot lose Masai Jury because that right. the vision that person that Masai has on building a team is so crucial to what we do. And he will he will figure it. Out. It might not be next year, but he will figure it out. And yeah, like so he's I don't, don't want to get into because he's like. They haven't renewed his contract yet, and I'm like, he, give him the team because <laughs> he's the best. Yeah. I I love Messiah Mas- Jury. Actually, if you look at the Toronto Raptor history, there's he should be like you talk about players getting statues all the time. Kyle Lowry deserves a statue. Messiah Jury deserves a statue for the Raptors. What he had done for that team, he's he amazing. Built, he built a winning team. Absolutely, and so in and. and winning organization and not only do they win they do it the right way and i i love that man he is amazing so that being said you actually have and perfect timing you have a follow-up and i think this follow-up uh to building a winning team couldn't actually come at a better time and so what what is the it's it's retention for a change retention for a change and it's it's not out yet it's going to be out pretty soon and I, I highly suggest, and like, if you are watching this podcast and you're not like jacked up, like I don't, <laughs> I did not, then there's nothing, there's nobody's going to do it for you, but building winning team, you can see that in the links, you can get that book, but tell us about your, your, the follow-up that's coming up and, and why it's so important right now. Right. So again, with my co authors um, uh, TJ and Joe, um, we, we, we wrote this book because we felt that it's important, not only for us to recruit positive people onto our teams and hire them, um, recruit talented people. People are going to make a difference, but they've got to stay. Mm-hmm. They, they, they've got to come. You, we can't, the turnover is unbelievable in, in, in education in some areas. So we've got to create these cultures. We've got to transform cultures. So people are knocking the door down to get in, not knocking it down to get out. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and then at this time, you know, with, the, with this pandemic, there's so much talk around a mass exodus of, of teachers, you know, um, after this whole thing is over. So there are key strategies in this book on what we can do in our cultures. What are, what, what are some strategies we can use to support teachers and other staff to support administrators? We often talk about teacher support, but administrators need that support as well. Because as you said, if we take care of them, yep. if I'm a district level administrator, and I take care of my principals, my APs, my administrators. They're going to take care of their teachers. Those teachers are going to take care of the children. So um, we've got to make sure that we're building systems that offer that support, but also that give them opportunities for growth. That means we've got to have those honest and authentic conversations, those difficult ones about change. We talked about change earlier. Change is important moving them into that zone into that zone where we know and only way for you to improve your community as an administrator is for you to improve yourself because the the principal or the administrator's most important job is to help teachers improve their practice right we build relationships Mm -hmm. and connections because we want you to improve your practice because you impact children in the pot in a positive way that doesn't happen if we train we hire people we have them for a couple years they leave and go make some other school better We've got to find a way to support these teachers and administrators, um, finding ways to highlight them, giving them a a building capacity, giving them opportunities to grow as leaders, giving them responsibilities, not Mm -hmm. just mundane 
you know, roles, but give them opportunities where they can grow, not just go through a situation, but grow through right. a situation, allow them to struggle, you know, and learn. So I think this book is going to be big, as you say, yep. very timely, very timely, 100%. and not just in schools, but in many organizations, it's a struggle to retain high quality, talented employees. So we have to begin to focus on not only how to re recruit them, how to retain them and hold on to them so the organization flourishes. Okay, so I got I got to ask you this cuz I like as I'm listening to you I think this is really important. So the uh one answer and I I just want your thoughts on this cuz I have a I have a very strong opinion when when someone says to me I'll say like hey how's your principal, right? And if they say this answer, I it's a red flag for me. It's like, "Oh, they're really nice. They let me do whatever I want to do." And I'm like that's, that's not good. That's that, that to me is not good. Right. And okay. So uh, it's not, I'm not crazy here. And one thing that you said that really is important to me is that we build relationships so we can help people improve. Right. And I, I, I believe that when you are, some people are really great at their work. They're really, and a lot of great teachers have principals who let them do whatever they want to do. But I really believe sometimes those teachers leave because they crave mentorship. They, they want to get better. And when they feel that they've kind of outgrown their administrator, they leave. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, am I totally crazy what I'm saying? Because I know like, hey, I, I want autonomy in my job, but I need someone to push me too. And that, that's the key. And then, you know, I hate to go back to sports, but I mean, even, even, even athletes, even entertainers, um, they, they all have coaches, right? They all mm -hmm. want, they don't want a person just blowing smoke and saying that I'm great. Like I, I need to get better, right? Um, that that's th right. this work that we do. This work is our passion. Our job is to get better at it, right? And I, I that can't happen if I if I have an administrator who's afraid to tell me what I need to hear. And and I mean, listen, and I'm not I don't want to criticize you know administrators, mm -hmm. especially these young ones. It's tough working with adults. Trust yep. me. It, it, my mother warned me about that, right? I told my mom. Yep. She said, well, I wanted to be a principal. She said, why do you want to leave teaching? I said, mom, I'm tired of breaking up fights in the cafeteria. She said, don't you know as a principal, you will break up more fights between your teachers than you ever had. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea was I knew that if I wanted to impact a larger number of students, I had to be able to impact teachers. But those teachers want someone who's willing to, and if you have a relationship and you come to them with compassion, you come to them with empathy, you come with patience, with love, with respect, mm -hmm. they will embrace and accept the fact that you came in and said, listen, I know you thought that lesson was great, but I watched those kids, right? And it was hard for you to watch them because you were caught up in the lesson. Some just right. did not get it, right? That, you know, um, let's talk about how we can make that better. Let me come. And that term person said, hey, help me out. Talk, talk to me. What can I do? You know, who can I go see who may have already done that? Because I'm coming to you with a level of respect. I'm telling you, you're doing a great job. But today just didn't go the way you wanted. But let me help you get it there. And 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 some I have to be honest at times to say, listen, I don't even know what I have to call one of my colleagues who's working with a teacher who's doing this. I have to be open and authentic and honest about that too. Mm -hmm. We have limitations as administrators, as right. leaders, but it doesn't happen if we're not honest and authentic. So, but the key is people want to be pushed. And you mentioned mentorship mentoring is so important. I think that's the part of leadership that doesn't get talked about enough. Mm -hmm. And of course you would talk about it because you're just the man. <laughs> I thought I was the man, but I'm the man <laughs> talking to the man. But yes, mentorship is so important. And mentorship means that when I tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear, I don't let you do whatever you want to do. I let you do what you need to do. Right. That's going to help you get better and help someone else get better. So I am, um, whenever people describe, I, I have no problem when people, when the people say, Hey, do you like your principal and say, yeah, I like him. It's just that it's times when I, I gotta, you know, he, I have to justify everything with them. Like mm -hmm. I hear people. Yes. Because you know what, if you're putting it in front of my kids, if it was right. my own children at home, you yep. have to justify it with me. Yep. So why should I, why should I green light everything to do the same thing here? These children in school are our children. So you're going to justify it. But if you tell me they need it, and they're going to benefit from it. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I get you what you need and 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 help support you. But if we have that relationship, then it's not then it's not difficult because we know that we're we're about improving one another. Because when we improve one another, everybody rises up. 
It's like if you if you ever get a chance to see Principal L in a keynote, you have to do it. Like, because I feel like I'm just I got this like one on one keynote right now, and I'm just jacked up. Hey, when this when this stupid stuff is all over, I'll tell you. I will. You and I are going to a Sixers game. I'll get tickets. I will wear. Uh, I don't know either an Embiid or a Simmons jersey. I don't care even if they're playing Raptors. Because you know what. <laughs> Even if I wanted to, I'm not dumb enough to wear a Raptors jersey at a Philadelphia home game. <laughs> I'd be terrified. Well, listen, Kyle Lowry's from there. Be, okay, maybe I'll wear a Lowry Raptors, jersey. Yeah, yeah, you'll have, you, you know, they'll, they'll, I'll just tell him you're just his long lost brother. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, there's no, there's no arena that I'd wear an opposing team's jersey. I'm too scared. I don't, I don't yeah. want to get trash talked the whole game and stuff like that, too. Uh, but you and I are going to a game. I'm, are you in? Like, are you in for this? I'm like, I'm in like Earl. Yeah, Flynn. probably. Like, probably if we go, you're, there's gonna be all these celebrities there, and they'll know you, and <laughs> probably I'll probably end up in TV show you right, and they'll say who's that BG guy that you're looking, you're hanging out with. You, you should see my Rolex, man. Mo Cheeks, Charles Barkley. <laughs> what? Well, because I've I worked with the Sixers, you know, for yeah. a couple of years before I started teaching, so I, I had some great. I mean, look. Oh no. This, this is my man right here. Oh, the doctor, Julius. Doc, the, the, and I actually met Doc when I was a kid. So I, I've awesome. known Doc like all my life. When he first came to Philly, he came into the community. Yeah. He wanted, you talk about, him. A, you talk about yeah. a statesman. Julius Irving is it, man. He was Julius probably, he, he was probably my first, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say he was my favorite player, but he was the first player that I loved, if that makes sense. And there was this really bad uh, basketball game on my computer where it was Larry Bird versus Dr. J. I don't know if you remember this. I, I would love to play it again because it was the worst uh, compared to what it is now. Like there's like two things you could do and it's just amazing. But I like love Dr. J growing up and just thinking about all those things. So I get, I get to, we should do a sports podcast one time too because I could we talk should, sports with you all day. We should I, I, because uh, Andrew, Tony and the boss. <laughs> Now, Danny Ainge said he still has nightmares about, they called Andrew the Boston <laughs> Strangler, right? You know, there was some war, Doc and Larry Bird, they fought one game. Yeah. I was so shocked. I mean, Probably and, then even... shook hands, and then shook hands right after, because yeah. that's what you did in the NBA. You in know, the, back probably, but, wasn't, um, probably wasn't even a foul when they fought at that time, right? So, no, not at all. Hey, hey at all. if you, okay, so you, you were like in TV for a little while and thank goodness you ended up in education. But if you, what's next? Like, I, like, I would love to know, like, what are you going to do after education? Do you ever see, there's a million things that I, you could do. I would just love to see like, what do you ever think like, Hey, if I ever leave education, this is what I'd like to do next. I'm in year 34 and I'm just, I'm, I'm just enjoying the ride, man. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I really, um, you know, I've, I've got a superintendent certificate. I got a doctor. I got a, yeah. but I just have, I, so at some point in my life, maybe I might become a superintendent. Maybe I might, um, assist, uh, some district yeah. with, you know, with some operations. Um, I'd, l I'd love to start my own school. Yeah. So that's my big dream, George. Mm -hmm. And I probably should get you to help me because you just connected to everybody. So I would love to start a public boarding school for kids who just don't have places to go place. There are so many teenagers who are homeless. That's the invisible population mm -hmm. that many people in, in, in our world do not are not aware of. There are yeah. many children who just don't have a good home to sleep. And so their, their Project C started a couple of schools, and I'm sure there's some out there, but I'd love to be able to build a school where kids just 24 hours a day, they're just loved and supported seven days a week, 365 days you know, a year that that's my ultimate goal. Well, here, here's what I can guarantee you. A bunch of people just listen to this podcast. And the second you start that school, they'll be applying. I guarantee it. They would love it. So principal, Al, it. principal, Al, I like, I took up way more of your time than I said I would, but I, you know what? I knew I was gonna take up more time <laughs> of talking to you. So I wasn't going to let you off early, but I enjoy it. Man. Thanks, I enjoy it. Man, man. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time to chat and you know, all your busy day and, and not only that, like, thanks for all the work that you do in education. So many kids are so much better off because of your influence and so many teachers. And I know I'm one of them. And I we're going to Sixers game, man. Can't wait. You got it. Okay. All right. Appreciate thanks. You, Take care now. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Have a wonderful day.